What's the word, y'all? Hey, listen, everybody here is an enjoyer of the game of basketball. You would have not have clicked this video if you didn't enjoy the game of basketball slash the NBA. But you have to be able to admit when things have gone awry, when things need to be changed. And this weekend, we saw two great examples of one of the worst things about the game of basketball, one of the worst things about the NBA basketball specifically that definitely needs some changes. Starts off a couple nights ago, we got Lakers versus Clippers, the LA versus LA Classic, and it actually ended up being a pretty good game until you got to the last couple minutes because the last 30 seconds of this game took 20 minutes in real time to finish. 30 seconds took 20 minutes of real time. You probably thought, oh, that's not that big of a deal. This doesn't happen often, does it? A couple nights later, Bucks versus Nets, another really good game until you got to the last minute or so. And this one, in my opinion, was even worse. Now, I don't know if the stats say this, but the last 20 seconds, 20 seconds of time, took 20 minutes to finish. Now, the first one, you had a bunch of fouls. You had some reviews. But the second one, the Bucks versus Bucks versus Nets game, I was so close to clicking off because I was so very annoyed. And I know I'm not in the minority here. Because the number one upvoted thing on Reddit in the last 24 hours, which has 25,000 upvotes right now, is talking about this issue. Shout out to Daniel Bauer. Um, after two clutch and exciting blocks by the Nets to keep their lead, Andre Drummond grabbed a rebound and was fouled with 21.7 seconds remaining. After that, there were two timeouts, 33 substitutions, eight fouls, 19 free throw attempts, and just one field goal attempt all over the course of 17 minutes in real time. It's 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 ridiculous, ladies and gentlemen. It's got to the point where it's it's devaluing the product. I watched. 47 and a half minutes of, of decent, good basketball, fun basketball. Uh, you know, one of the teams is heavily depleted because their star players either injured or, or ramping themselves up. And the other team got an MVP candidate. It was solid. It was a good matchup. And then that last 30 seconds hit and, bro, impossible. Impossible. I thugged it out. I thugged it out. And I feel like most of y'all thugged it out too. But there were so many things wrong. And I've complained about stuff like this before. Because there's basically two to three different issues inside this one core issue. And one of them is the fouling when you're up by three or more. I understand it. Again, I understand it. Don't come at me in the comment section saying it's the, it's the statistically, analytically, it's the right play. It's good coaching. You know, you don't want to allow a three. For the optically... The basket, the NBA, the National Basketball Association is definitely about its entertainment factor, right? It is the antithesis of entertainment to see a team down by three and not able to at least get up a shot. It sucks. And that is what happened on the both sides of this game. Oh, we're up by three. Let's go ahead and get a foul. Oh, we're up by three again. Let's go ahead and get a foul. It sucks. And listen, I admit, if I was a coach, I would probably do the same thing, but I'm not thinking about I'm, I'm not thinking about it from the coach's perspective. I'm thinking about the millions of fans that are at home watching this game. It's not fun for us. And the kicker of it all, the kicker of it all. Again, a shout out to Steve Nash. A, a beautiful game to be winning. All things considered, consider the circumstances to be going against the defending champions with a very depleted team. This is a very big win for them considering they were on a 11-game losing streak at one point in the season and couldn't beat anybody. For them to beat the opposing champions or, or the defending champions is dope. And we're going to talk about the Bucks because they suck right now. All of that. You know, the, the idea is we're going to foul up by three because we trust our free throw shooters. Kyrie Irving is 50-40-90, or he has been 50-40-90 in his career. He missed the free throw. And guess what? You did all of this, turning that 20 seconds into 30 minutes, and the Bucks still were in a position to tie the game. It's not like you completely secured the game by playing this way. LaMarcus hits both of his, and guess what? The Bucks have the ball uh, down by three with two seconds to go. If you just let this game play out the organic way, you're still in the same position as before you started the foul thing. It just sucked. Hey, big win, though. Again, big win. I'm not discrediting the win, but I'm just saying it was boring as hell to watch 30 minutes of just this. And in the Lakers-Clippers game, that had to do around the, the refereeing and, and the fact that we had the longest review of all time. And and what, what bothers me the most, as I, I'm <laughs> – listen, I'm not saying that us at home are better at our jobs than referees because there's a reason they get paid the money and there's a reason why they do they what they do. 
But the first replay I saw of that play, I could immediately tell what it was or what it should have been. And guess what? It took them 20 minutes, or I'm exaggerating. It took them a very long time, different angles. We hit up Steve Javi back in Secaucus for him to say the same thing that I saw in the very first replay. There has to be a time limit. If we can't figure it out within the first three minutes of looking at it, then we're going to just stand on our grounds of what we originally called. Has to be a rule that if we're up by X amount of points, we can't foul. We can't intentionally foul. I don't know. Adam Silva, get to work, my guy. Get to work. It got so bad. The people the other night were tweeting at me asking, uh, should the NBA should incorporate an ELIM ending for fourth quarters? I'm like, bro. That, that lets you know that the product ain't looking good when people are like, forget uh, 25, 30-point comebacks in X amount of time. We want it to be like the All-Star game. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not with that, though. No, 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 no. Anyway, let me know in the comment section what you think could be done about all of this. Um, quickly touching on some of the things from today, James Harden and Joel Embiid continue to do their thing, which is uh, draw a million fouls. And they're going to be... If they stick together for a long time, they're going to be one of the most hated duos of all time, strictly based on the fact that those guys get their fouls. Um, and you know what? I'm not even mad at them for it. Yeah, every one of their games might be four hours long, but I'm not even mad at them because they have figured out a way collectively to manipulate um, the referees, which, again, this season the referees told us we not we not falling for that shit this year. And here we are 50, 60 games to the season, and they're falling for it just like it was three years ago. Um, but shout out to him, man. Joel Embiid fouling out both centers for the Knicks is a wild thing. There's a tweet I saw that I had to quote. Um, and I, I want to show y'all this tweet because one of the most underrated things about the NBA, one of the most underappreciated things about the NBA is the scouting department. So uh, at TV Bassinine, Bassine, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, tweeted just for fun the average height, weight, and draft position of each team this season. Um, and I don't I don't really care about the average height or weight of an NBA player that's not or NBA team. That's not very interesting to me unless we got some crazy anomalies. And I ain't even looked at it until this moment. The thing I'm more um, geeked about is this column average draft position. Um, the Orlando Magic and the New York Knicks have the the lowest draft position amongst teams, which makes sense. They got, you know, R.J. Barrett, third overall pick. You know, Julius Randle is a high pick. And you know what I'm saying? At the very bottom. By a wide margin, the Miami Heat average draft position of their roster is 41.3. Insanity. And my tweet was the Miami Heat don't have any business being that good in, in scouting talent. And it would be higher or lower. How do you lower? Higher? It would be better, but Victor Ladipo's on the roster. And Bro ain't even played this season, but Victor Ladipo is a top three pick. If you just look at the rest of the roster, excluding Victor Oladipo, it is insane how many low-tier players, low-drafted players are on this roster and contributing to championship-level basketball. Will they win it all? We don't know. But they're a contender. Jimmy Butler, 30th overall. Now, now again, they don't get the credit for that. The Chicago Bulls get the credit for that one, baby. <laughs> you feel me? We get the credit for that one. But the other ones? They definitely do. Max Struss had been on a couple different teams before he got to Miami and became a real player. Um, Gabe Vincent had had been in and out of the G League. Duncan Robinson, I'm pretty sure, was undrafted. Now he's making $15 million a year. Great story. Caleb Martin. And then occasionally you see like Hayward Highsmith get minutes and be okay. They have continuously over the last couple seasons been able to just find diamonds in the rough. And, and yes, they've been able to hit on free agencies like Jimmy Butler and Cal Lowry because the city of Miami is beautiful. I've never been there, but I've heard stories. City of Miami is beautiful. They built this culture that people want to be a part of. But none of that really matters unless you're able to build the exterior things around them. And that's how you find the diamonds in the rough. It is insane how good they are at this thing. The Toronto Raptors are similar, but Toronto Raptors aren't necessarily great right now. This team is a championship quality team right now, and their average draft position is mid-second round. Uh, Denver has done a really good job of that as well. Speaking of the Denver Nuggets, they just won another game today. I didn't watch a single second of this one, but I did see that Jokic scored eight points, and they won by like 25, which is like... If you can have Jokic do that and still be winning, that's a good sign, especially since there was a report later, uh, earlier today that Michael Porter Jr. is ramping up and he might be ready to go by mid-March. Very interesting. If you remember my video from early in the season, before the season even started, I made a video basically saying these are my teams that might be sleepers to win the championship, and there are some misses in there for sure. There are some misses. 
Did I say Boston Celtics in that one? Very interesting. I, I got to go back and rewatch it. The Denver Nuggets were in there for sure because I just believe that if Jamal Murray comes back and Michael Porter Jr., who a lot of people had had penciled in as a most improved player candidate, if both of those things click, then boom, the Nuggets can be right back there in contention. Right now, they're in a 6-7 game streak. Boogie Cousins has been amazing for them, by the way. Shout out to Boogie. They have not lost the games when Boogie is suited up for them, and hopefully they guarantee his contract for the rest of the year. Michael Porter Jr. being back could be very, very good for them and just make the Western Conference playoffs be a whole nother monster. It could. Now, before he, he went out with his injury, he wasn't looking great, and I would assume that he was trying to play through that injury. But if we get last year's version of MPJ and then Jamal Murray eventually coming back, which he said he will come back this season, this six-seeded Denver Nuggets who have been able to trail water enough for them to be out, outside of the play-in, could be a team that people are like, hey, I ain't trying to see them in the first round. Because you still got an MVP player in Jokic. And we got a, a proven playoff player in Jamal Murray. And Michael Porter Jr. might be I, right, he might not be. Who knows? And that's good because because I was listening to um I was listening to No Dunks and and I never really I haven't really realized how much, how many big injuries have, have been going around the league right now. I'm gonna just go through some of the top teams in the league and tell you the injuries they're currently dealing with or have dealt with. The Miami Heat were missing Jimmy, uh, uh, Laurie, and Adebayo for a significant time. The Heat, I mean, I'm, I'm, the Bulls are missing Lonzo and Alex Caruso currently. The 76ers win an entire 60% of the season without Ben Simmons, and obviously they figured that out. But no Colin Sexton, Darius Garland is now missing time. The Bucks, let's quickly talk about the Bucks because they are struggling. And actually, I didn't even realize they were struggling until I did my daily dive onto Reddit and a post by Nitro, Nitro XYZ says, gone completely under the radar, the defending champion Milwaukee Bucks are 11 and 12 in 2022. And they're the five seed. Not ideal. And one thing that desperately hurts them is... is a couple hours, a day, 48 hours, 72 hours after they traded um, they traded Dante DiVincenzo for Serge Ibaka practically, Pat Connaughton goes out and injured. And now they just don't have the wing slash guard depth, especially when Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday haven't been playing up to their standards. And I, I'm still trying to figure out, and I think that was a consensus in this uh, like this overall thread, or th thread? Is it a thread? Um, people are trying to figure out if this is just like, post-championship fatigue or is this something we should really be concerned about and I, I don't have an opinion just yet but definitely looking back on the surge deal now that you you had an injury that you could have predict it looks it looks a bit iffy the Boston Celtics had not been healthy the entire season until basically right here in this moment the Brooklyn Nets you know their struggles and if we go to the Western Conference now Chris Paul is out um, you still got Draymond Green out, Michael Porter Jr., Jamal Murray. Then you got the L.A. boys, um, Kawhi, Paul George, and Anthony Davis, the, the Zion Williamson. The list goes on and on of like just big, high-level players that are currently not playing basketball. And if any of those dudes can come back in time for the playoffs, this season playoffs is going to be insane. The Eastern Conference is already frightening the hell out of me because my Bulls can't beat anybody that's good. So, yeah, we the two seed, but dang, bro. You know what I'm saying? If, if we match up against Boston, we match up against Brooklyn, who, who I don't even know if they're going to get back on track. I, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid. But it also makes for good basketball, and that's what we're here for, more entertaining basketball. I know this video is all over the place, no real topic other than the, the first one, but I'm just happy to pick up a microphone and talk all things basketball. If you enjoyed it, as always, be sure to leave it a like. Let me know in the comment section what you think. Oh, also, I made a tweet as I was watching this game that just wrapped up. Um, flex every Lakers game that's on national TV. I'm done. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. It's not even entertaining. You know how, like, some things can be not good but also entertaining? Like, oh, my God, this is about to be a shot. But shout out to the He's the homie. Back in the prime Fortnite days, I used to watch Los play Fortnite. He is ass. He was terrible at it. But he was so bad that it was fun. The Lakers are so bad, but they're not fun either. You know what I'm saying? It used to be, oh, look at them. Oh, they can't stop turning the ball over. Ha, ha, ha. I'm past that point. Go put on go put a good team on TV, please. Go put a good team on TV. Other team that uh that blew a game. Um 26 to 1 run for Spencer Dinwiddie in the Dallas Mavericks. Spencer Dinwiddie, Crypto Kid. Crypto Kid really turning up after the trade that line. I guess he entered the locker room and people didn't tell him to shut up immediately. And that does a lot for your mental health. And he's actually hooping. Luca. 
continuously making that MVP uh, candidacy just a little bit better. Obviously, he's not on the same level of maybe the top three guys in the in the race, but he up there. He, he doing it. 